I'm Carla Cox, and um, I don't know how I get this reputation. I do not have type 1 diabetes. <laughs> I hang out a lot with a lot of people with type 1 diabetes, but I often get that um, question, oh, you have diabetes, don't you? I well, no, I really don't. Um, but anyway, my background is nutrition and exercise physiology, um, and I do, am a certified diabetes educator for the last 30 years, so I've been coaching people with type 1 diabetes for a very long time, I have about 300 or more people in my practice. And I love sport, um, and so my favorite thing in the whole world is to combine my nutrition, my exercise physiology, and my love of working with people with type 1 diabetes and trying to figure it all out. So that's why I'm here. And my name is Ben Clements. I have had type 1 diabetes myself for about 10 years. Uh, I don't have the educational background that Carla does yet, but I'm working on it. I'm a third year medical student. And I've spent about the last seven years working just about every summer at kid, or with kids at diabetes camps. And most frequently, I take them out in the woods, and we do uh, week-long backpacking trips, canoe trips, and things like that. That's where I am. Cool. And we actually did a couple of backpack trips together with insulin dependence. Um, I also work at kids' camps, and uh, I've been doing that for about 12 years and do both Colorado and Montana, and we always can use volunteers. So... <laughs> Okay, so our topic is backcountry endurance sports and the individual with type 1 diabetes from research to practice. So this is just our introduction and me trying to strangle Ben, I guess. So our objectives from my perspective are to understand the basic physiological changes that occur. And you're going to hear a little bit of a recurring theme from a couple other things that I've been to today. Um, but what happens with exercise? The concept of fueling the muscle and applying the insulin. The difference between fueling the muscle and treating a low, and I think that's one of my big... Um, things that I, I want to get across today, and then what to take besides a sleeping bag and a tent for safety, and that's where Ben takes off. He gets to do the, he gets to do the fun stuff, yeah, absolutely. I, I was talking about switching with him, but it didn't work out so well. So anyway, um, exercise, I'm going to kind of go over what, what is um, exercise for the person without diabetes, and then how do we change it if you have type 1 diabetes. So it's a combination, as you guys know, of aerobic and anaerobic exercise and movement. And anaerobic is classified as short bursts of activity, has a minimal impact generally on blood glucose. In fact, it's why a lot of little kids, when they're exercising, we don't change their insulin doses because they're just like spontaneous and really fast and then really slow, so all these spurts of activity. Um, and they can, however, deplete glycogen stores over time. And for those of you that were not in the earlier sessions, glycogen stores, we have them both in our muscle and our liver. And when we are active um, and we don't fuel our body, we can deplete those stores. And even when we do fuel our body, if we're overly active and do endurance sports, we can still deplete those stores of glycogen, put ourselves at risk um, of hypoglycemia. Um, aerobic is endurance movement, and it utilizes fats, proteins, and carbohydrates for fuel. Um, the slower we go, generally, the more we rely on fats for fuel, but we always need carbohydrates, um, all of us, whether you have type 1 diabetes or you don't. So when we talk about fueling for exercise, um, carbohydrates are really the fuel that supports the working muscle. So every time you contract a muscle, you actually need some carbohydrate on board, regardless of how slow it is. Um, protein is an important factor, too, but it has very little impact on fuel for sports performance, particularly if you're fueling yourself correctly. So what protein does generally is repair body tissues. Um, so if you tear something, it helps to fix it. Uh, fighting invading viruses. Um, no one wants to be sick when you're on a mountain. And then um, also it makes muscles and height for adolescents that are growing. So fats, as we know, prov provide us with a lot of fuel for um, exercise as well. Um, and our stored fats is kind of a long, uh, we have a lot of fat, even if we're not really overweight, but we have a lot of fat stored that we can pull from for activity. Um, and individuals don't generally run out of fat. You don't say, oh, I hit the wall, I just ran out of fat. You know, <laughs> this doesn't happen. So, but the thing about fat is we actually require carbohydrate to be able to extract that fat and use it well, those triglycerides, and use them well. So all hikers and climbers, and we're going to focus mostly on that, though this certainly applies to everything that you do, whether it be, I just got back uh, from last night, I was on the Missouri River with Insulin Dependence Group and uh, drove home and flew out early this morning. So um, it can apply to, we did five days of canoeing, and we'll, I'll share a little bit of highlights from that. Um, but it, it applies to all these things where you're out there day after day, kind of at a, at a moderate pace, and you just keep going and going. 
So the longer the duration, the greater the use of all fuels. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, if you're moving your muscles more, you're gonna need more fuel than if you're sitting um, doing the video thing. The higher the intensity, um, you also utilize carbohydrate um, at a higher rate, actually, and even repeated bouts of activity. And, and a really good example of that that we all are aware of is basketball, where you're doing this running down the court and then stopping and running down the court and stopping. So any of that kind of thing. Or if you're hiking and you're going up a steep hill and then you kind of slow down, they go up a steep hill and maybe get to a nice little um, flat spot. The other thing that really makes a difference on how much energy you need or how much fuel you need is how fit you are for that sport. So those of you that bike and then you go running, do you notice that there's like a change in how much insulin you need? You're just not as efficient as you were with biking. Um, or a great example, um, one of my favorite people actually that I've ever worked with was a gentleman that was on this last canoe trip and uses 55 units of insulin um, and is an avid runner, 55 total units a day, and he was down to 15 on our canoe um, because really um, he is less efficient. Um, and I kept thinking, oh, there's not gonna be that much change, it's just upper body stuff, but there's a big change. So anyway, fitness level, he was fit for running, but he really wasn't fit for canoeing. Um, so it made a big difference on fuel utilization. Energy also depends upon the temperature. If it's cold in particular, you're gonna need a lot more energy, and we're talking total calories now, not just my macronutrients. You're gonna need a lot more, and most of that's because of clothes drag. So you're carrying a lot more mass, you're carrying boots, you're carrying a big down coat, um, and so um, you actually need more um, energy to support that. Also, terrain. You know, obviously, if you're going uphill, you're using more energy for the same two miles as you would if you were on a flat surface or going downhill, particularly if you're on a bike and you get to coast. Um, so energy for hiking and climbing. The general guidelines are that the larger the person, the higher the energy demand. We all know that, right? So if you're a big person, you get to eat more. And if you're a little person, you don't get to eat as much. Um, the less fit you are, once again, the higher the demand. So if you're uh, not really fit for hiking, you're gonna be less efficient and you're gonna need more calories than if you were um, fit for that particular activity. With fitness comes this increased reliance on fat for fuel, less carbohydrate fuel at the same intensity, which is really important for you to recognize when we're talking about fueling your body for anybody, but particularly when we're talking about it for someone with diabetes and how you're gonna adjust your insulin. So when you're fit, you use less reliance on carbohydrate for a lot of physiological reasons we can chat about later that most of you probably don't care about, but I can chat with you about those. And even more true if individuals' activity is specifically trained. So if you're trained for hiking, that's what you're most efficient for, um, and you're gonna be using fat at the same intensity um, versus if you're not trained for that particular sport. Does that make sense? So you're gonna see much more variability in insulin requirements if you're not fit for a particular sport, even if you're fit overall, I mean, you're cardiovascular fit. Um, your muscles may not be fit for that sport. I think another thing that's really important, and I guess this is my little hurrah box, but um, you, you know, you really got to watch calories in, calories out, right? So when you are physically active, you need a lot more calories than you're not physically active. We all know that. But I think one of the things we have to be very careful of is how we fuel for sports. So if you're fueling and you're feeding yourself because you know that's the right amount of calories you need for your sport, you're hiking, you've got the calories figured out pretty much, someone's helped you with that, or you're hungry and you want to eat something. But if you're always eating energy bars, cliff bars, whatever, and the reason that you're eating those is not because you're fueling your body, but because you're treating a low, and you could be using glucose tabs at a quarter of the calories, you actually can offset that fuel balance, and you could start seeing weight gain as a, as a potential problem. So obviously we want to prevent the lows, but as you guys know, no matter how hard you try, that doesn't always happen. Um, and then the other problem is too little fuel, whether it be macronutrients like carbohydrates or just calories by themselves, you end up with weight loss, loss of muscle mass, not enough energy to go on, and you don't have enough protein to provide, um, protein may end up providing energy if you don't have enough calories, if you don't have enough carbs, um, and you end up not having the fuel you need to really be very efficient and do really well. So here's some studies. This is actually came out of Ansley. Um, inadequate calories in hiking. So if you do multiple days of hiking, what happened to people? And these were people that didn't have type 1 diabetes. And they had their mean, their average blood glucose fell uh, low to middle range. So they're not going to be low, low. They're not going to be those under 40s. 
uh, because they don't have diabetes, they're not taking insulin, but they, they did have uh, lower normal blood sugar numbers, and so they ended up being grumpy. Surprise, surprise. So they had really negative responses. And the other thing that was interesting, this sounds a little nasty, but it was really interesting, was during uh, wind and rain, um, they actually end up with lowered rectal temperatures, which will be part of that study, um, with um, low energy intake. So another problem, oh, this is a totally a, a side comment, but I gotta make it. So we were in an exercise physiology lab and, and <laughs> just thinking of rectal temperatures. And one of the, you know, the, the professor says, okay, so, um, you know, who wants to be the, the subject for this particular um, activity? And uh, this particular lab, and then one girl goes, me, 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 he goes, great. So he hands her this probe, <laughs> it's a rectal probe, and says, here, we're gonna put you in the heat chamber. So anyway, you'd wanna volunteer for one of those. Okay, so calories, needs for hiking, men, uh, about 5,016 calories per day over 10 consecutive days of hill walking, and that's continuous walking. So, um, that's a lot of calories. Most of you are probably not eating 5,000 calories a day unless you're like about seven foot eight inches tall. Um, and about 4,800 for uh, 20 days of a 500 kilometer road race um, running. So those are some calorie things I'll just throw out. Those are both um, men. And then this was an interesting study actually on a woman with type one diabetes that climbed this absolutely gorgeous mountain in Borneo. Um, she's 27 years old, and they actually put her at um, the same length, but the elevation changed, and also the incline, and she went from needing 2,948 calories per day at a very low, pretty low intensity, 40% VO2 is pretty darn low. Um, so she was casually, casually walking and hiking, one might say, and um, when she changed the pitch and she changed the elevation, she almost went another 25, 30% calories. So just to be aware that those calories change with you know, once again, duration was the same, the, the, the distance was the same, but the um, incline was different and the altitude was different. So calorie needs change for everybody, regardless of whether you have type one or not. Yeah. I didn't see the actual You know, I, and I wished I'd pulled that out and I can't remember what it was. It was something like 10 to 12, the, the last one here was something like 10 to 12 miles a day. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't put that in there. You know, the first time I, we gave this at AAD, and of course I just read all the studies, and now I can't remember. I can look that up for you, though. Um, so what about macronutrient dis distribution, meaning carbohydrates, fats, and proteins? So what are the general nutrition guidelines? So once again, fats predominantly used, because endurance, we're not going to probably be, this is not a marathon, this is endurance, five, day after day, 10 miles, 12 miles, 15, 20 miles a day. So... Um, you still have to complement it with carbohydrate. And there are several articles that are put out. In fact, one of my favorite authors, Magam, is Ron Magam is a, uh, from um, Britain. He's done some great stuff. He's on the IOC committee. But anyway, he, so he's a very, very good source of information. Several articles. He actually put people on a, a lower um, carbohydrate diet, and indeed, they were able to complete it. But once again, they were um, these same folks on another study were getting pretty grumpy and, and not very happy. So multiple studies, I mean, study after study after study after study shows that the benefits of carbohydrate to fuel muscle during activity. I, I, it would be really hard to find an exercise physiologist, nutrition person that would tell you that um, you really can do as well on, a, on an incredibly low, pro, low fat diet or low carbohydrate diet. Generally, the longer the duration, the higher intensity, the greater the need for carbohydrates. And that's out of Juca Droop, once again, probably the premier research in my mind on carbohydrate metabolism. I actually cornered him one day and said, do you think it's any different for someone with type 1 diabetes? And he said, no, I don't think it's any different. He's worked with some people. I don't think he's done a plethora of research, but has worked with some people as well. So, so here's the daily carbohydrate recommendations for moderate exercise. It's about a gram per kilogram body weight um, in an hour of exercise. You know, generally 60 grams an hour. Um, they've shown that you can go up to 90 grams an hour, but those are people, once again, this isn't just endurance, la, la, la kind of stuff. This is higher intensity. And they used actually different forms of carbohydrate. So instead of just using one form, they use multiple forms because we have different transporters in our intestine that will take up different forms. But for most of us, we don't need to be doing that, okay? So um, somewhere between 45 and 60 grams of carbohydrate an hour is recommended. Um, just to fuel your muscle. Now, we're not talking about preventing lows here. We're talking about fueling you. So for active kids, I work a lot with kids. It's 8 to 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight for um, prolonged exercise. Yeah, 
And then another piece of nutrition for exercise is hydration. And this is always a big deal. And everybody says, oh, you got to do so many liters. Well, you know, American College of Sports Medicine gave that up a while back. So the, the idea is that you drink to thirst, and everyone's a little different. The, the problem is you got to you got to listen to thirst. It's easy to just not do it, isn't it? And I find I love climbing. I do a lot of climbing. And um, the, the hardest thing is to continue to recognize that even if you're in a cold climate and you're on ice, that you still need to be uh, melting that. I, I see a nod here. Melting that uh, ice and making it into fluid and drinking it um, to keep hydrated. We had some pretty, have some really nasty slides at Denali, and, and uh, the urine looked pretty dark brown. It was so, we were also dehydrated, and that was just stupid on our part. Anyway, heat exposure, hydrate to maintain fluid balance, um, and, and there's, a, there's a good way to do that, and I'll show you that in a second, but cold exposure actually increases um, need for uh, fluid as well as heat exposure, and we forget about that. We get what's called cold weather diuresis, where you um, get peripheral vasoconstriction, Close to your core, your kidney says, ooh, got plenty of fluid here, and excretes it. So you end up with an added amount of um, fluid excretion. Ventilation, just breathing hard, you end up with a not lot more um, fluid needs, and then it's really tough to drink um, because you have to melt all your ice and make it into, and that takes fuel. Fuel takes weight. Weight is what you have to carry. Um, so drink to thirst, but listen to thirst when you're being um, in the out of doors doing things and try and... Um, not to delay when you're, don't get behind. Um, and, and drink to urine color, how does that sound? So here's a chart, this Armstrong's chart from 2000, and you, you really don't want clear urine completely, but you want to have it these light pale colors. And it's interesting, I did some research on mushers during the I Did a Rod, the dog sled race across Alaska, and, and, and the guys are all like, yeah, we do that already, we do that already. Not a single woman said she actually turns around and looks at that urine, so it's a good, uh, but it's a good, it's a good measure of hydration. The guys, of course, I'll do it, painting the snow. So, so what specifically about diabetes? What's different about people with type 1 diabetes? And I'm not talking type 2 here, I'm talking type 1. Fueling. There is no evidence that persons with diabetes need a different fuel source. Sorry. Um, you need to fuel the body, and then we need to figure out the tricks of insulin. And it is a trick. <laughs> it's a big trick. So we just have to figure out what works for you. And, and you know, there's all these great ideas um, of what to do, but I, I will tell you, having done um, really a lot, of, a lot of camps and a lot of years, you know, the difference between me and you sometimes, I think, is that, and, and those of us that work in, in, as type threes, is that um, we end up working with 150 people with type one. And so we see this whole slate. And even on this last trip, um, and um, we had people who were lowering girl, ki, ki, uh, teens that were lowering their basal rates by 10%, and those were lowering it by 80%. Lots of variability. So you really have to figure it out yourself. So fuel the body. I don't tell the person that lowers it by you know, 10%, oh, you can only have so many carbs, sorry. <laughs> and the person that lowers it by 80%, you need triple. You know, you need triple the carbs. We just say, okay, how is this going to work for you? This is, this is how we should probably fuel your body. Now, how are we going to work around that insulin piece? So during activity, carbohydrates, once again, are the preferred fuel for higher intensity work. They're all holding Laura bars here. Climbing with a heavy load and breathing hard. Um, and there's also this improved, um, Sheree Kohlberg mentioned this, is you, you actually end up with improvement in these. There's this kind of attachment piece on the skeletal muscle. So on the outside of the skeletal muscle, um, when you contract these GLUT4 receptors, are like little protein pores, but the insulin attaches to them, and this whole to them, and this whole cascade of events happens, and glucose goes into the skeletal muscle cell. When you flex, you send more of those to periphery, so your insulin's much more efficient. Mine's much more efficient as well. So my body will naturally just suppress the amount of insulin I'm, I'm making. You guys don't have that option. So um, we just have to think like a pancreas here, which is one of Gary Schreiner's titles for one of his books. But that's what we need to do. So you get this, this GLUT4 transport, but you also get something called non-insulin mediated glucose transport. And what that means is there's other pathways. And it's really clever because our body needs more fuel, needs more glucose when the muscles are contracting. And so we have this system in place to allow that to happen. But now you've complicated it by breaking your pancreas. So it makes it much more difficult to kind of think through this because you've got these mechanisms that are, that are making it much more difficult to control. But you still have all this need for carbohydrate, and we need to think about how we're going to adjust the insulin. Make sense? Yeah. 
So what about after activity? Well, replacement of glycogen, because you've used that up in, within the skeletal muscle. You've used some in your liver as well. And you need to um, particularly replace it when you're going to have another activity the next day. And so carbohydrates at dinner really make a lot of sense. Um, so you need to be ready for day two. Your insulin may be still very, your, those transporters may still be very active, so you need to think about how much insulin you need for that meal, because it's going to be different than it is on a day when you're sedentary. Yeah? This is regarding hypoglycemia and, and heights. Uh, for most glucometers, there is stereotypes that, that they show, the reading shows 2%. Yeah, yes, yes and no. So I'll show you a slide where they've looked at probably about eight different studies looking at glucometers, and it depends upon the glucometer, um, which really makes it confusing. So one of the only things you can do is take control solution. Um, and you can check your own meter and see what the variability is. I mean, meters are already 10% error, even when you do it at home, right? That's the variability. So we already have an error, and then we add altitude to it, and we're adding another little error. But it's not consistent. If it was consistent, it would be easier. Yeah? I would argue that temperature is a much more important variable, certainly for the altitude that we're talking about here, than an actual length of 4,000 meters, for example. And if it were so direct, you could have an algorithm to account for it. But you temperature can't. is definitely going to be a much more important variable that you have to control for. Yeah. It's a lot of variability, yeah. a lot of variability. And you know, it'd be really neat to put this linear slide up. Like you said, there could be an algorithm for doing it. But it, it, the, the meter was different. Didn't matter which, which brand of meter it was. There was variability from brand to brand, so which you do, ha do need to do if you're going to be climbing really high. Now, over 10, up to 10,000 feet, there doesn't seem to be a huge variability. But there is some. So I'll show you the studies in just a minute. EPOC is excess post-oxygen consumption, just meaning that you're still churning out more fuel use um, even post-exercise, and we talked about that in several um, presentations this morning. And you can have that potential for hypoglycemia six to nine um, hours out, and, and I think um, one of the reasons I'm a little dreary today is we always, <laughs> I should say dreary, a little tired, is that we always get up at one to two o'clock in the morning and check everybody, um, adults, kids, doesn't matter, right, Greg? Wake up. Um, I do have to tell you a little funny thing that we did this time. So we had two guides that don't have diabetes, and they were with us. And they really wanted to know a lot about diabetes. They were great. They were just really wanted to know what the kids were doing. They wanted to, you know, they were looking at the pumps. They were doing all this kind of stuff. So Tracy, the RN, then went with me, and I decided that we would wake them up too. So 1 o'clock in the morning, we go to their tent, and we say, oh, i got to check. Oh, you're low. So we gave them some treats. And then we went around, checked everybody else, and we came back. And we said, oh, still low, got to check again. <laughs> so the cutest part of the whole thing was these two guys were laughing so hard in their tent um, because we kept checking. And he said, when I was coming around the second time, he went, oh, no, we're still low. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about just having the kids get up at alternate times and go wake them up, but I didn't do that. Anyway, so there's a potential for hypoglycemia six to nine hours post, and so we make sure that we um, check and you should check too. So if you have some exercise you don't do on a regular basis and you do it, you got it. Yeah, you guys know that. You got to check. You got to check. And you know, I'll put someone like we just did a college trip with kids with type 1 and because they begged after camp that we could do another, that we could keep doing it. So what can you say, no? So we took them on a college trip and, um, you know, I checked them at about 11 o'clock at night and they were, both these boys who are now 6'2 and 6'4 were, um, you know, like 169, 179. I'm thinking, ah, you know, maybe I'll just let them sleep. Good thing one of them was 69, you know, heading down with his sensor. So you just got to check. Here's an example of a food plan that I think works pretty well. So some kind of carbohydrate for breakfast, um, some energy bars uh, mid-morning if people are hungry and feel like they need something. The other thing that I do um, quite a bit is put some in like either Tang or Gatorade to have strength in a water bottle so that you can, you're sucking on some carbohydrate during this kind of slow endurance kind of activity. I think trail mix works really well too. I uh, just got to watch how many dried bananas you put in it. Um, cheese crackers, apples, energy bars, and jerky. Jerky's always a hit. 
and then some kind of um, carbohydrate in the evening like rice and beans kind of thing with uh, corn, tortillas, cabbage, whatever. Um, and then they always like s'mores, but that always kills them. So what about the insulin? So the job of insulin, of course, is to move glucose into the fat and into the muscle cells. And as I mentioned, exercise does that too, so it kind of works similarly. Um, it does restrict the liver's ability to release glucose too, which is a problem. So if you've got too much insulin on board, it's not going to allow you to do gluconeogenesis, uh, glycolysis very well, and it also helps to store fat. So um, once again, glucose moves freely um, into the muscle during exercise. We already talked about that. Um, and in a person without diabetes, um, we just don't make as much insulin. So we just have to think like that. Um, insulin is the drug. Changing basal or bolus, um, the options, what do I need to do for exercise? Well, endurance. If you're doing endurance, you're going to need to, to lower the basal rate and probably uh, consider lowering the bolus as well, kind of depending upon you. High intensity, maybe not, interestingly enough, unless it's repeated bouts. Um, in fact, there's been some studies showing that if you weight lift before you do endurance, um, you don't end up with the hypoglycemia associated with your endurance board like you do if you don't weight lift first. Very interesting stuff. Hard to do on a backpack trip, I guess, unless you want to lift your pack 25 times before you take off. And then this whole thing about um, Repeated high-intensity exercise is another way you can, you can have hypoglycemia. I love this picture, and I told Erin I was, I was putting it in my slideshows because it's Erin um, changing uh, her um, infusion set at 10,000 feet. I love that, with uh, Ashley in the background checking her blood sugar. That was not staged. She was doing that. Um, so th these are kind of the variables. So the amount of, here's my recommendation. Change your basal rate somewhere between 10 and 70%. So I think that's about the only real clear information I can give you, unfortunately. Um, I will say that you, and, and I think that's a, a, a theme that came from the three of us that kind of talked this, about this topic today, is that um, you, you really need to change the basal before you walk, start your exercise, because of course that great insulin we have now that's so much better than the old insulins, but it's still not rapid acting, is it? Now it's got to drag. So about an hour from now is when it's really going to have an impact. So if you think about it, okay, in about an hour we're going to start taking a hike. Let's start thinking about lowering that basal now. Um, and then testing is my favorite theme. In fact, one of the guys on this trip, the one that was only using 15 units of insulin a day instead of 55, said he brought 20 strips per day, and he was afraid he was going to run out. So um, I carry a little yellow book, and everybody knows when we say, okay, guess what? It's testing time. Uh, we even had a little sign, you know, instead of the OK, we had a at-met test. So we just all gunnel up our canoes and everybody would be tested. We test about every hour, pretty much when we hike. I think that's what Ben and I pretty much did, too. You know, the other thing about taking a group of people with type 1, for those of you who have not had the privilege of doing that, it really is a joy. But um, if you don't all stop and check at the same time, can you imagine? Every five minutes, someone else has a low. So you really have to do it as, as group um, and check. And then, of course, we check more often if need be. Um, the other thing you could do is reduce the bolus um, like a pre-hike option. You could say, OK, um, it's dinner, and we're going to go hike after dinner. Kind of think about this. You know, Maybe you want to do a half uh, bolus for dinner and because and, you're going to be more efficient in using your, your insulin. Um, the other option is you can just keep eating. Uh, we went through 400 glucose tabs which is my preferential treatment. So we did that, and we did the, um, some of the um, shots, the liquids. The kids love those. Um, so I'm, someday I'm just going to keep a record so I have some idea of exactly how many we go just for fun to see. Um, don't you love this picture on the right? That's all of the stuff that keeps everybody alive while we're doing this. This is their glucometers and the pumps and the sensors and the... Glucose, there's even a bottle of glucose tabs there. I felt that was very appropriate. Probably did almost as much as the insulin does. Um, changing basal or bolus, the after. After the activity, think again, check, 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 check. Um, overnight basils, I always check at 1 or 2 a.m. And I, you know, the, the old thing was check at 2 a.m., but that was with NPH. A lot of the studies were actually done with NPH. So I would say in the last three years, there's been a lot of studies coming out with the new insulin, which is awesome. But once again, it's individualized. Um, 
Example of food and insulin plan, assess the individual. So I look at every person we talk about it. You know, how fit are you? How fit are you for hiking? What do you think we ought to do? Um, and what is his or her past history with exercise and blood glucose? But once again, if they're not trained for hiking or not trained for canoeing, it's going to be different. Um, little information uh, available, but you know, you can start at a 50% reduction in basal and go from there. I mean, that's a nice starting spot. In an hour, you're checking, you see yourself starting to escalate, you're looking at your sensor and it's starting to escalate, you change it. Um, I, you know, the, it, it's, it's not a, it, you're never going to get it 100%. And I think the biggest thing in all this is don't beat yourself up. Just say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try this. You know, this is a different, this is a, if we're checking all the time, you're never going to be running too high or too low for long periods of time. And I, I, I think that's the answer to diabetes right now. Hopefully there'll be a better answer in the future. A lot of strips. So I'm just going to throw this in a couple slides on climbing high. There is a potential for an increased um, insulin needs at high altitude, which has been shown in a couple studies. So I think that's an interesting, just kind of throw it in there and don't ask me to tell you how much, because once again, everybody's different. Um, they did have a study where they actually decreased the amount of insulin, a Kilimanjaro study, where they decreased the amount of insulin by 50%. It was a little too severe. I don't think anybody made it to the top or just very few people. Um, so that was, in, and with the need, a Kilimanjaro is over 19,000, and so um, they might have even needed a little extra insulin rather than reducing the basal. Altitude illness is no more common in people with type 1 diabetes. Um, one really interesting thing about altitude um, that's off, off of the diabetes topic, but you, you have to have the gene for it. You don't have the gene to get altitude sickness. You aren't going to get it. Isn't that intriguing? Um, meteor accuracy, here you go, here's my slide. So here are, the, here are the just four out of, and there's actually been quite a few studies done on, on meter accuracy. Um, so 60% of them in the first study on the Kilimanjaro read 40% low. It's a big chunk, not too accurate. And then in a hypo, hypobaric chamber, one underestimated, one overestimated, well, great. <laughs> That's great. Which one are you? Um, and then another one in a hypobaric chamber, which is a neat way to do this, um, is most overestimated blood glucose. And this was in, in a variety of meters. Um, and in another one in 2000, they tested, um, said that they could go up to 3,000 feet without much variability. So um, take it for what it's worth. So here's my take-home message for monitoring. Take control solution number one. Check at various elevations and adjust if needed. And no significant difference in most studies between glucose oxidase or glucose dehydrogenase-based blood glucose monitoring. So you, know, you can't say one is that much better than the other, surprisingly. So here we go. Do you want to do you want to say it or do you want me to say it for you? <laughs> to climb a mountain is the archetypical metaphor for overcoming a life challenge. For me, the act of climbing or mountaineering has many parallels with managing a chronic illness like diabetes. Both activities require motivation and informed decision making. There are inherent risks with mountaineering as it is with living with diabetes. The greatest risk of all, though, is being paralyzed by fear, real or perceived, and succumbing to myths surrounding life with diabetes. So thank you very much for that quote. I did not know he was going to be here, but I'm delighted to meet him. So from here, we're going to give it to uh, Ben, and he's going to talk about the fun stuff. All right. I get the fun stuff. And we only have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes left before the next session. So if people need to leave, uh, go ahead and jump out now. Go ahead and jump out in the middle of that. Uh, this, this, it's all fine. Um, also, Carla and I gave this talk about two weeks ago to the AADE. And it was a very different audience. And I'm fortunate to have a lot of expertise in this room. So as I go through my slides, uh, there's a lot of things that you guys may find that you do differently, and I'd love to hear that. So well, let's make this a collaborative session instead of uh, uh, one direction. So this is a trip that um, there are several people in the room who are featured in this picture. So Greg's back there. He's halfway back in the list taking a photo of me. Uh, Carla's here, and Jerry's there, and Jerry's sitting in the back. So we're out in the middle of nowhere, and what I'd like to do for the next 15 oh, minutes... Montana. It's nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> we're far from a lot of resources. We're, we're far from safety nets. And what I'd like to do is talk about all the scientific stuff that Carla just talked about and figure out how to take all that and put life with diabetes out here. And I'll do it in four ways. We'll talk about partners. We'll talk about gear, both um, kind of outdoor gear and diabetes-specific gear. We'll talk about food. Carla's covered most of that. And we'll talk about planning. 
So partners, I think the biggest message for partners is not to go alone. It's important to bring a safety net with you, and the best safety net is someone else who can help you respond. Um, and I think it's really important to train your partner. You can see I'm over here on the far right of that picture, and the guy next to me is my good friend Andy. And I can say that, or this because he's not here, but Andy's very well trained. Uh, we've done several trips together, uh, backpack, uh, backpacking trips for about a week. We've done backcountry ski trips together. We've done tons of stuff. And I take him with me, or he takes me with, with him, um, because he can recognize all the symptoms of diabetes. He, he knows when I'm high, he knows when I'm low, he knows when I have to check. He knows how to use the supplies if I am unable to use them. And he knows when to act um, if something's wrong. Most importantly, Andy and I share this great understanding of what my limits are. So I don't think there are really any limits to activity with someone with diabetes, but realistically, there are times when it's not safe for us to to move. Um, if I have ketones, for example, that would be a really um, unwise time to, to start hiking. So on this trip right here, we're about halfway through a traverse of the presidential range. We did all 26 miles in one day. And the night before, I had an occlusion of my Omnipod. So we had to uh, set back our start date. So instead of starting at about 4 in the morning, we started at 6 so that my blood sugar could come down. And we discussed this long in advance so that Andy knew what my limitations are. And he knew that if something like this were to happen, we'd have to delay the trip a little bit. And it was fine. We got through it. And we had a great, great 12 hours of, of running and hiking. Um, next, diabetes is a team sport. And I think it's really important that if you're traveling in a group, at least if you have someone with diabetes, to stay traveling as a group. Don't spread the group out. If something goes wrong, it's important to have the strength of the group to react. And finally, be open about your needs. So if, there's, if you're feeling low or if you're feeling high, it's important to discuss that with the rest of your group so that uh, the group can respond. Now for food, Carla spoke a lot about fueling the athlete. And this is one of the things that I've learned from her over the last couple years of being her friend and working with her is really you can approach diabetes and exercise in two ways. You can prevent low blood sugars and focus your whole activity plan on just not being low and not being high. Or you can fuel your body based on the nutrition and the calories that you need and titrate the insulin accordingly. So that's what we try to do on all our trips, is that second approach of finding what your body's going to use and then regulate your insulin based on that. And then as far as what kind of treatments you take, I break this down into really three questions. How much do you need? What should you take? And um, how much can you possibly carry? So starting at the bottom, how much can you carry? That's going to be very difficult. If you're on an ultra marathon, you're going to be going as light and fast as possible. But if you're on a canoe trip, you can take as much as you want. I mean, you can take Dutch ovens. You can take your whole refrigerator. It doesn't matter. You're just paddling. Um, but if you're if you're rock climbing, you got to be really specific about what you take up the up the rock with you. I usually say take four to six treatments of about 15 to 20 carbohydrates, or plan for four to six per day. If you're going by yourself or in a, in a small group of just one person with diabetes, that's probably fine. But if you're going with a larger group, it's, uh, I think, smarter to take a lot more than that, as Carla, Carla said, using about 400 glucose tablets over five days. Um, and then it's also really important to think about where you're going and what sort of activity you're doing. So I look at the climate of where I'm going. If I'm going skiing, for example, I'm not going to take items that can freeze. So those glucose shots probably aren't the best idea. Um, cliff bars also become like really nice bricks when you're out in really cold climates. Also on um, paddling trips where you're out under the sun for several hours, things like Skittles, they melt and you're out of your treatment. So think about where you're going and, and what's, the, what's the best solution. OK, to get into gear specific to diabetes care, this is really my starting checklist for any activity that I do in the backcountry with diabetes. I pack as light as possible. But I also plan to have things go wrong and to have enough supplies so that if they do go wrong, I can react. So Carla mentioned that um, Steve was testing 20 times on this most recent trip. I plan that on any trip I go on that I can test at least 20 times. And that's changing now that a lot of us are relying on sensors. But if you're going based on just blood glucose meters, 20, 20 test trips a day I think is fairly appropriate. 
Um, it's important to have a backup meter, uh, lancet devices. And I prefer the lancets with the drum. That's just my personal preference. It decreases how many you need to throw away and what you do with all these really sharp little things that you're now carrying around with you. Um, the rest of it, I'm sure you can read through on your, on your own here, but syringes are fairly important to carry in case pumps, things like that uh, fail, that you have both syringes and long-acting insulin that you can respond with. Uh, this is a fun picture from one of my trips when I was working with Camp Joslin. This guy, Mike here, didn't follow our packing list, and so he just had the normal amount of pump supplies of changing uh, one every three days, and then he had one fall off, and then he had another one fall off. And this is, you know, he's got one left, and we've got three more days of this backpacking trip. So we were doing everything we can to keep these pumps on him. So we just duct taped them to his arm. You know, if they're not falling off, they're not going to get occluded. Um, from the rest of this list, I think the thing that stands out to me is having printed doses. So any of you who've been out in the backcountry, if you have a pump fail or a meter fail, it's important to have a record of what you were doing before you went into the woods or what your plan was as you're in the woods um, in case some of these devices fail. So if your pump does fail, you can always convert from, you know, basal, um, from basal rate to basal insulin, but without a record of what your dose is, it's really difficult to do. Um, I'm just going to jump back here, but for those of you who have a lot of experience in the outdoors, is there anything that you want to add to these lists? If you do, jump in. Yeah, go ahead. I would, um, for me personally, I would take a Pedialyte. That's one of the things that I use when my blood sugar is too high for too long, mm -hmm. so I can rehydrate, and that way I can prevent more DKA from happening. Just because the reason I say that is I got stuck in the woods when I was first diagnosed. I had no insulin. Mm. Thank you. I have a slide coming up later about hydration and water purification, but Pedialyte I think would be great. Go ahead. That's news to me. Great. You bring up a really good point. I think a lot of us have very few failures with these devices when we're in the front country, but as soon as we get into the back country, there's <laughs> things just happen. Yeah. Yeah, we got we were just doing this uh camp scrubbing for last anchorage and we got to keep the sights and TV lights off with the temperatures and all. How do you do that during a game of basketball and things well, like that at camp? That's a great solution. I haven't tried that yet, but I think I will. That's coming up in a few slides, yeah. Okay, I'll keep moving on, but if anyone else wants to jump in, please do. Okay, so let's talk about we have all these great supplies, we have our lists, uh, what do we do once we're out there? It's really important to protect these supplies from the elements. So in this photo, this is from the um, Allagash River, these two blurry folks, uh, one is named Jake, he's sitting in the back there. and. There he is about 10 minutes later when we finally found a calm spot in the river. And you can see there's a couple inches of water in his boat. So what I, what I had for Jake and the rest of the people on this trip is a dry bag that I've strapped to the thwart here. And they have treatments and meters and sensors, sensors facing out so that you can actually see it. Um, 
and that keeps everything dry and, and safe, which is a really good solution. And then on the, the other photo, this is a trip from the same waterway, but farther up uh, that I did with just a couple friends. And what we did here was take all of my supplies. I was the only person with diabetes on this trip. I took all of my supplies, I separated them half, half the syringes separated, pump sites separated, insulin, a bottle in each pile. And then I put a pile in each boat so that if one of these boats is to go over, I don't lose all of my supplies. I only lose half. And I've packed twice as much as I think I need anyway, so I should be fine. Uh, here we go with the Frio. So if you live in the desert or you're going into any hot climate, a Frio is an excellent device. Has anyone used these before? Perfect. So we know how they work. Basically, you dip them in water, and then within um, what is it, about eight hours, they're ready to go. And you get to keep device or uh, insulin cold for about 48 to 72 hours, right around 50 some degrees, and they work really, really well. And you can just dip them in a stream, you can dip them in a hotel sink, it doesn't matter, they work really well. For cold weather, we don't have um, any commercial devices that I'm aware of that, that help us keep things warm. But as David mentioned, temperature really does a lot with meters, and we know that um, insulin freezes, and that becomes a problem. So a solution that Carl and I have come up with, and I'm sure others of you have done this, but take those chemical hand warmers, put them in some wool socks, put all your devices in the wool socks, bag them up, put them in the middle of your, of your pack, and that works really well. Um, don't put it right next to the insulin, but put it in a different sock and wrap the whole thing up. And no, it, it hasn't gotten too hot. But you don't want to have the, your insulin sitting right next to the chemical pack. That would that would make it too hot. Go ahead. Um, for me, that, that sounds like it would, it would work pretty well for a short-term trip. I mean, your, your body itself, you have a lot of heat in your body. Usually when you're wearing multiple layers, if you're able to keep those things very close to your core in a way that's not going to overheat you, but you can keep both insulin as well as um, your pump or other supplies that are temperature sensitive, um, it, it work, can work very well especially for winter, long-term winter trips, or if the day temperatures aren't going to go basically you know, above, well above freezing, um, you know, multiple weeks in a row with, with something, you know, basically everything kind of on a lanyard or protected, even potentially the tubing itself, if you're pulling out a pump to view it in an extremely cold temperature, things can freeze very quickly. So there's a number of prototypes and designs that people have done, and everybody sort of customized their own thing, where the meter stays in the bag, and you view it, and you put the strip in what stays in there, and you can keep everything basically warm. So it works, but that's also a great solution with, with the warmer. Yeah. I think you're exactly right. Your body generates a lot of heat. You might as well use it. Yep. OK, uh, to get to hydration, there are a lot of great devices out there that help us um, purify water, which is essential anytime you're going into the backcountry. And I recommend that everyone take at least two ways to purify water. So you can boil water, that's a really easy way. Um, chemical purification tablets are great. Uh, I use a SteriPen when I'm going on personal trips because it's really fast. It uses UV light to purify water. Carla's gotten me hooked on gravity filters for, um, for big trips. And not that this helps you purify water, but Ziploc bags and duct tape are great to have anytime you're going anywhere. This is a photo from uh, our trip to Montana. At the bottom here, we've got a group of kids using one of the pump action purification. Um, Steve, we haven't met yet, but I think this is actually one of your photos. Um, there's an array of solar panels that you can use to charge cameras and uh, continuous glucose sensors or monitors and sensors. Uh, and there's a new product out called a BioLite stove that uses uh, just the heat from a small stove to power iPhones and Dexcoms, whatever you want to do. So if you're going out for more than five or seven days, you've got ways to keep your electronics charged up. OK, this is from this is from Montana last year. And I put this up because this is about our second day of hiking. And all the kids and adults, we checked at the same time. And we got some great numbers here, 100, 104, 106, 107, 117, 97, 151. And I think Jerry's meter turned off at the end, and we don't have his number. And, and they were that way the whole trip. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> Not the case. Not the case. It's a joke. But for a while, it was perfect. 
So we recommend that you check about 15 times, 15 to 20 times a day. Obviously, if you're using a sensor and you think you can rely on that data, check much less frequently. But it's important to check before meals, um, and then just about every hour when you're on the trail. It's different when you're working with a big group of people and a big group of camp folks, as, as Carla mentioned. Um, you can have one person stop to check, wait 15 minutes if they're low, the next person will check, and you have to wait 15 minutes for them, and that can eat up your whole day. But if you're in a group of people, check once, check all together, and keep moving. So before meals, every hour, and then before known hazards. So this video was taken in Yosemite. Uh, Jerry was on that trip, Carla was on that trip. And this is cheating because we've already crossed this river, but we shot this from the other side. So it looks like, uh, looks like a nice little stream here. But I'm gonna go off the mic for a second. So we started over here, and there's this great little bridge, but it was all flooded because it was about uh, late June, and all the snow melt had come down from the hills, and so you couldn't get to the bridge. There's the river going around the bridge, so you had to cross the river to get to the bridge to cross the rest of the river. And we stopped so that everyone could check, because if anything were to happen, um, the water's about neck deep and really, really cold. We wanted to eliminate all the risks, or as many of the risks as possible, take diabetes off the table, so that when we got to this, <laughs> we didn't have to worry that diabetes was going to be an issue. We could just focus on the environmental hazard. Did you turn around and go back? No, we did not go back. <laughs> okay. And then, Carla mentioned this briefly, but um, checking at night, we check about two hours after dinner. Again, if you're using a sensor, you get the, the readout over the whole day, so you don't have to worry about this. But before bedtime, to know what your trend is, if you're going up or if you're going down. Sometime overnight, I've worked with groups that say exactly two hours after people go to bed, at two o'clock every night, it doesn't matter. If, just check once or twice, or get your sensor readout. And the most important part of this whole process is taking time to process the data. We've got photos here from a trip that I led with Camp Joslin. We've got one of our young leaders working with one of our campers. And they went through the whole day, not writing down numbers, but just reading out what, your, what the kid's blood sugar was. And at the end of the night, we stopped to look at the whole day and look at the patterns, look at the basils, look at how much food they were eating, write it all down, and look at the trends. And we asked some really simple questions of what worked, what didn't, and what are you going to do differently tomorrow? And so it's easy to do that when you're with a, a camp group, and that's part of the whole process is education and teaching kids how to understand this data. But very few of us on personal trips really take the time to look at it and study what you're doing and change your behavior. And it's very easy to, to make the same mistakes day in, day out. But I highly recommend taking time each night to study what you're doing and make changes. Uh, I'm going to turn this slide over to Carla because she's got a much better story than I do. So this is our um, this is our trip that we just took um, to uh, well that actually isn't the picture from the trip but anyway we were in um, Montana an area called uh, the Bear Tooth that is notorious for having uh, bears grizzly bears and whatever anyway so I'm with a nurse practitioner we could say she's a nurse practitioner in training and you'll understand why I say that now so anyway we took these college kids and. We were backpacking, and we we send all of our our food up in the bear tree, right? So we string it all up, and um, we're good. And um, I crawl in my tent, and she crawls in the tent with the girls. And um, about eleven o'clock at night, she it's just pouring rain. I mean, it's just buckets. We had this huge thunderstorm. I mean, just where you can't even see between the water, you know, just pouring down rain. And and she comes running to the tent. She says, "Quick, quick." Um, we're out of glucose tabs, and uh, Lauren is at 30. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I pull my bag of, su of supplies and, and hand her my glucose tabs and hand her my glucocon. And, of course, i got to get out of the tent, too. So I'm out of the tent. I'm running over there. Well, error number one, she was 130, not 30. She didn't hear the 100 because it was raining so hard. And she actually said to Lauren, quick, eat. And Lauren is jamming M&Ms in her mouth because she thinks that um, she can't understand why Jordan's telling her to eat M&Ms because she's 130. But anyway, she's doing it as an obedient adolescent. The funniest part about this is Jordan wasn't out of food. I mean, she says, I'm out of food because, so I need your stuff. She had sent all of her treatments 
androglucagon up the bear tree. So that was a teachable moment for the nurse practitioner in saying that the chances of us getting beaten are by a bear are probably much lower than the chances of a hypoglycemic episode. <laughs> That's my story. And so you have to, you have to weigh that risk of chances of getting eaten by a bear. Depending on where you are, it's pretty low. Um, some places it's higher. But your chances of having a low blood sugar after a long day of hiking, pretty high. <laughs> um, so we'll talk briefly about correcting high blood sugars. There's a, a general rule in the front country that if you have a high blood sugar, you correct it with your pump. You wait two hours, you check again. And most of us keep correcting with our pumps. Um, but in the woods, we, we really want to make sure we follow this rule is on that second check, if you're still high, change out your site and give an injection. And uh, this photo here is also from the Allagash, another trip. And uh, this is my friend Joe. He had uh, had a high blood sugar all afternoon while we were paddling. We got into camp and I said, Joe, it's time to change your site. Definitely give an injection. And uh, has anyone ever paddled up on the Allagash? I know we're on the opposite side of the country, but um, it's a really long waterway in Maine. And Maine in June is just full of bugs. There are just clouds of mosquitoes. And as he's giving his injection, a mosquito lands on his hand. He just finished giving his, in his insulin, and he takes his syringe and just goes and spears the thing, takes his blood back up, and he did not inject it back into his body. <laughs> but there he is with a mosquito on the tip of a syringe. Um, and then at camp, we have uh, all the kids running around, and especially on these wilderness, wilderness trips, their hands are just filthy all the time. And it's typically like tree sap on their hands. And so you check, and their blood sugar is super high. And it's probably not because they're actually high. It's because they were just you know rubbing their hands on the tree. So clean your hands as much as possible. Figure out why that blood sugar is high, and then correct with an injection. Um, this is one of my last slides, talking about planning. When Carla and I make a trip, uh, or plan a trip, we spend months talking about it on the phone, going over maps, we send maps back and forth. We really understand exactly where we're going. Uh, sometimes she even goes out there on her own just to see the route before we're there. Um, we share it with each other, and then we share it with the whole group. And I think it's really important that everyone on your trip know exactly where you're going, what the trails you're going to take are, what trails you're not going to take uh, if you're going off trail, um, it's important that everyone know the plan. But most importantly is that everyone know the evacuation plan. So you know how to get out at any point in your trip. So we have it mapped out. So if we're at this point in our day, on our third day, we know how we're getting out. If we're at this point on our fourth day, it's going to be a different route out. We know exactly where, what trails, uh, where we're going to go once we're out, and who we're going to call to help us get out. Also importantly, we know why we're going to evacuate. So we talk ahead of time to say, these are the things that are not diabetes related that we're going to evacuate for, and these are the things that we can tolerate. And then with diabetes in mind, these are the things that we can tolerate. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just that simple. Um, but you have to weigh the benefits of um, if you have someone with DKA on your trip, or if you have DKA, do you want to stay in the woods, or do you want to start an evacuation? If you have to give glucagon, are you going to stay, or are you going to go? You have to have that conversation ahead of time so you're not trying to make that decision out in the woods. Uh, and that's going to be different for every trip that you're on. A, a group trip or a camp trip is going to have a much lower risk threshold than a trip that I go on by myself. Uh, and there's a photo of Greg uh, up in Maine doing some backcountry skiing. Um, an emergency prep. So know before you go as a general rule. Uh, educate yourself and your entire group of your route and the supplies that you're taking. One of the trips that we led in Yosemite uh, one woman on the trip was just really nervous and apprehensive the whole time, and I couldn't figure out why. Until weeks after the trip, we had a phone call, and she said, you didn't have glucagon, you didn't have first aid, you didn't have a, a satellite phone, you weren't prepared for risk at all. And we had all that stuff, and Carla and I knew about it, and we were both trained in wilderness first responder. We had everything in place, but we didn't share it with the group. She didn't know, and so she was worried the entire time. Um, how many of you are certified in wilderness first aid, wilderness first responder, wilderness EMT, fellow of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine? I'm on my way there, one more year. Um, 
I highly recommend to anyone who doesn't have those certifications to spend the money, take the time, take the class. You'll be much safer in the woods and you'll know what's safe and what's not. And those around you will have more support. And then finally, tools for emergency preparation. Obviously, we all have cell phones. Personal locator beacons are great new devices. Um, we particularly use the spot device. There are some that are more, um, more reliant on government services. We just like the spot. It's easy. Um, it's customizable. Satellite phones are really expensive to buy, really expensive to rent, but they work just about all the time. And, then, and they're very heavy, yeah. So again, weigh your risk. If you want to take a satellite phone, the technology exists, but it's expensive. So. Okay, um, for my last slide here, I've got a quote from a book uh, called Deep Survival. If anyone hasn't read it, I highly recommend it. But uh, Lawrence Gonzalez writes, the perfect adventure shouldn't be that much more hazardous in a real sense than ordinary life, for the invisible rope that holds us here can always break. We can live a life of bored caution and die of cancer or diabetes. Better to take the adventure, minimize the risk, get the information, than go forward in the knowledge that we've done everything that we can. <laughs>